video is going to be about legalism. Um, I've been called a legalist. I know other people, uh, other Christians have been called a legalist, like Brian Moonen. Um, a person that who, <laughs> I've been called a legalist because <clears throat> because I say that Christian men shouldn't have long hair, or that Christians shouldn't have tattoos, or Christians shouldn't listen to rock music. But that's not legalism. Um, that's what the Bible teaches. You know, there are verses in the New Testament that that would tell us those things, uh, that would agree with those. If I said that a, per, uh, a, per, a guy needed to have short hair, or uh, you can't have tattoos, um, otherwise you can't be saved. Like, if I said those are a requirement for salvation, then that would certainly be legalism. But if I'm talking to a person who is already saved, and I'm saying that, that you need to do these things or not do these things, then um, <clears throat> that's not legalism. That's instruction and in righteousness. Um, so I'm going to clear this up. What is a legalist? What isn't a legalist? <clears throat> I'm going to read an article from David Cloud. I think I agree with most, most of the stuff that David Cloud teaches. Um, I know he's, he's all for the modern church system and stuff that I'm against. But um, besides that, I think all this doctrine and stuff that I know of is pretty correct. So this is an article from wayoflife.org from David Cloud. It's called You Legalist. Legalism is a term frequently used to describe Bible-believing Christians who are zealous for pure doctrine and who desire to maintain holy standards of living in this wicked hour. I am called a legalist via email at least once a day. Consider a few examples. You, sir, are a legalist that the Pharisees would have been mighty proud of. You have a narrow-minded, legalistic view of Scripture. I write contemporary praise music, music that is used in churches and worship of God. It is not for your approval or anyone else, no matter what denomination or off-the-wall sect of a denomination they are. Your website makes me cringe. I can understand why this world hates fundamentalist Christians. When you write legalistic articles like this, there is no humility in your critiques, only a pharisaical elitism that makes my stomach turn. Okay, so those are some examples of people calling David Cloud a legalist. The free-thinking attitude that lies behind the charge of legalism was expressed at a Christian rock concert called Greenbelt 83. We don't believe in fundamentalist approach. We don't set ground rules. Our teaching is non-directive. We want to encourage people to make their own choices. Those who have this type of mindset label the old-fashioned Bible Christian a legalist. But it is a slanderous and wrong-headed accusation. Okay, this is what, what true legalism is. What legalism is. True legalism has a two-fold definition in the Word of God. First, legalism is, a mix, is to mix works with grace for salvation, Galatians 1. This is the theme of the epistle of Galatians. Paul warns the churches against turning from the grace of Christ, Galatians 1, 6, and emphasizes that salvation is not by works, or law-keeping, but by the grace of Christ alone. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Galatians 1, 16. For as many as were of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one <clears throat> that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Galatians 3, 10, and 11. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith, but after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Galatians 3, 24 and 25. According to this definition, legalists today are any who add works to the grace of Christ for salvation. The Roman Catholic Church does this. So does the Church of Christ and the Worldwide Church of God and the Seventh-day Adventism, Adventism and many others. Second, legalism is to add human tradition to the Word of God. Ye, ye, ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for the doctrines the commandments of men. Matthew fifteen seven through 9 We must be careful never to add our own tradition to the teaching and teachings of the Word of God. There is one authority for faith and practice, and that is the Bible. Anything that is exalted 
to a place of authority equal to the Bible is condemned by God. The Pharisees of old, in committing both of these errors, were true legalists. They rejected the grace of Jesus Christ and taught that the way of salvation was by keeping the law of the law, and they made their own tradition authoritative over people's lives without a biblical basis. The Roman Catholic Church also commits both of these errors. Many others add things to the Word of God today. Christian Science add Mary Baker Eddy's writing, Seventh-day Adventism, Adventism, Adventism adds Ellen G. White's writings. Um, <clears throat> many charismatics add, at least in practice, personal revelations and experience. Some old-time charismatics made prohibitions against drinking Coca-Cola and wearing necklaces and exalted these rules to the level of Scripture. We must be careful when we seek to apply the principles of Scripture to Christian living that we do not fa fall into this trap today. For example, to set specific standards of modesty for female church workers that are supported by clear scriptural principles such as requiring a certain dress length or forbidding shorts is not legalism. Because the Bible requires modesty and forbids nakedness, even defining it as showing the leg and thigh as such, Isaiah 47, 2 and 3, and warns about the effect of female dress on the male, Matthew 5, 28. Setting standards can become legalism if the requirements go beyond Scripture. We must be very careful in drawing lines, that our lines are God's and not our own. I have heard of the churches that have forbidden men to wear pink shirts because it is allegedly feminine. But this is going far out on a limb. The color pink, while vaguely associated with femininity, is not so intricately associated with it that we can make a clear law about it. Other churches have forbidden beards and facial hair. One mission that supports Central American national pastors has this rule. But it's more than ridiculous. It is legalistic because not only does the Bible not forbid facial hair on men, it encourages it by the example of Old Testament prophets, Ezra 9.3, and even Jesus Christ himself, Isaiah 56. Beards are mentioned 15 times in the Bible and never in a negative context. Another mission board required that missionaries cannot be interracially married and forbade the missionary couples even to adopt children of another race. But while there are practical issues pertaining to interracial marriages and adoptions, the Bible nowhere strictly forbids this. Thus we repeat, we must be very careful in drawing lines that our lines are God's and not our own. Okay, this is what legalism is not. <clears throat> Having seen what legalism is, let us consider what it is not. In a nutshell, for a Bible preacher to urge God's people to obey the details of God's word by the grace of Christ cannot be legalism, because this is precisely what God requires. Consider the following scriptures very carefully. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2, 8-10 Here we see that while the blood-washed saint is saved by grace without works, he is saved unto good works. The believer obeys God's word, not in order to be saved, but because he has been saved. It therefore cannot be legalism for a preacher to urge God's people to keep the words of God contained in the New Testament faith. I have counted 88 specific commandments in the epistle of Ephesians alone. Consider this one, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, Ephesians 5.11. This is a far-reaching requirement. The believer must guard every area of his life, every activity, to make sure that he is not having fellowship with the, unf with the works of darkness. Not only so, but he is to reprove the works of darkness. This is one of the verses that spoke to my heart 32 years ago and convinced me that I had to put rock and roll music out of my Christian life. It is certainly an unfruitful work of darkness, but the requirement does not stop with music and involves every part of the Christian life, dress, companionship, music, entertainment, literature, relationships with churches and professing believers, you name it. To take such commandments of the New Testament faith seriously and to apply them rigorously cannot therefore be legalism. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Titus 2, 11-15 
Here again we see that the grace of God, the grace of Christ, does not teach Christians to live carelessly, but to live strictly. The grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, which is a far-reaching obligation. It means that we are to examine every area of our lives and churches in order to root out ungodliness. Again, this involves every aspect of the Christian life, dress, companionship, music, entertainment, literature, you name it. And notice in Titus 2.15 that the Spirit of God concludes this passage about avoiding ungodliness with the following exhortation to preachers. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. The preacher has a solemn obligation before God to speak, exhort, and rebuke on the basis of these passages. It cannot, therefore, be any sort of legalism. If a preacher takes this obligation seriously and applies this teaching to every area of life, speaking, exhorting, and rebuking about ungodliness and worldly lusts in the area of music and dress, companionship, entertainment, etc., I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead... At his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Second Timothy four, one through two. Here we see a similar obligation to the one in Titus two fifteen. The preacher has a solemn responsibility before God for his preaching, and he will give an account to Jesus Christ. He is to preach the word. What part of it? All of it. He is not only to read the word verbatim. He is to preach it and apply it to the people's everyday lives. He is to reprove, rebuke, and exhort. He is to make sure that the Word of God gets down to where the people live, to apply it to every aspect of their individual lives, their family lives, their employment, their service for Christ, their companionships, their entertainment, their dress, their music, you name it. The Word of God speaks to every area of life, and the preacher is obligated to follow it wherever it leads. This is definitely not legalism. Teaching them to observe all things, whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even till the end of the world. Amen. Matthew 28.20 20. This is part of the obligation of Christ's great commission. Those who believe the gospel and are baptized are to be taught to keep all things that he has commanded. This is another far-reaching requirement. It means that the churches are to be connected, are concerned about all the New Testament faith and not just some part of it that happens to be popular at the moment. And they are to train people to keep all of it. The churches are obligated, therefore, to teach separation from the world, separation from false teaching, rejection of heretics, church discipline, and reality of eternal hell, repentance, denial of self, everything. They must teach the popular things and the unpopular, to take Christ's commandments seriously, and to seek to, seek to be faithful to the whole New Testament faith cannot, therefore, be legalism. Strict obedience to God's word by Christ's grace is the way of liberty, not bondage. Then said Jesus to the, those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John eight thirty one and 32 The love of God is to obey his commandments, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. 1 John 5, 3 the believer does not keep the the believer does not keep the word of God in his own power and strength or to his own glory. He keeps it by the power of the indwelling Christ and to his glory. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians two twenty. Okay, so I hope you know now what true legalism is and and what a false legalism is. So, thanks for watching. God bless. Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven.